Once again, I, Dr. Anupama Engineer, co-founder and COO of the Inuit Biosolutions Private Limited, welcome you all for the next session on International Women's Day celebration. Today, I have with me a lady who is beyond just an inspiration. I must begin by saying that it is my privilege to introduce a self-made lady of such a magnanimous stature. Let me introduce to you all someone who doesn't require any, any formal introduction, Dr. Sujata Sharma from Ames, Delhi. Sujata Sharma is a protein structural biologist, biophysicist, writer, and a professor at the Department of Biophysics of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. She is known for her studies in the fields of protein structure, drug design, and antimicrobial drug resistance. She has been awarded the International TWAS Prize for Science Popularization and the Peak Life Women Inspire Award. She has also been awarded the prestigious National Bioscience Award for Career Development and National Women Bioscientist Award by the Government of India. She is a recipient of Kalpana Chawla Excellence Award for her contributions in science and literature. She's the author of five science fiction books, Kovi's Promise, Tumhara Bholu, Warriors in White, The Secret of the Red Crystals, and A Dragonfly's Purpose. Deeply passionate about fostering a scientific temperament in the society, she has her own YouTube channel called Science Popularization by Professor Sujata Sharma. She is the founding president of Bio Footprints, a society which consists of scientists and doctors who are committed to promote science in the society. Dear Dr. Sharma, it's a privilege to have you here. And without any further delay, I request you to begin with your presentation. Thank you so much, Anupama. This is really a great honor for me, especially on the International Women's Day. And uh, the fact that you've given me so much freedom to speak, uh, and I'm gonna speak my heart out now. So uh, this is basically my journey as a professor and uh, as an author and a YouTuber. Let me tell you that uh, when I had started as a student in science uh, back uh, in 1991, I had never thought that this is the way my journey would go. I had imagined something very different. I had thought that probably I'll be publishing a lot of papers and uh, maybe uh, you know trying for really, really very prestigious awards in science. However, the tra uh, trajectory of my life has gone in such a way that I have found myself in yet just another place. And I love this place actually. So I have nothing to uh, complain about, no regrets. In fact, I'm thankful that um, I've been chosen for whatever I'm doing today. So uh, yeah, so I'll just briefly tell uh, something about the work that we are doing at AIDS New Delhi. We are working on antimicrobial drug therapeutics. So we've got two approaches for that. First, we work on natural antimicrobial proteins so that we can develop them as um, uh, protein antibiotics in future. And second, we develop ligands against bacterial protein targets. And we are working on various multi-drug resistant bacteria, fungi, and, and viruses. So uh, this uh, now I'll begin with my personal journey, of course. My beginnings, I was actually born in Ames because my father, Dr. R.C. Sharma, he was a faculty member in the Department of Pharmacology. And my mother is a very renowned uh, Hindi writer, Maitre Pushpa. So uh, you can say that uh, science and literature were given to me um, by genetics. And I had become very, very fascinated with both science and literature right from the beginning. So my childhood was like this. Uh, you know, I have taken some sketches with, from the book, autobiographical book that I have written. This sketch is from that book. Um, we were three sisters. So there was a lot of woman power at home. And uh, our afternoons were like this, that our mother used to read out a lot of stories. Uh, and uh, the ones that we loved most were about uh, Dr. Albert Schweitzer. Now he was a doctor who treated the poor ailing people in Africa. And uh, there's a, a legend about him that uh, he actually went there and he found a hen house where, you know, the hens coop, where hens live and he made a hospital out of that. And he did it all because he wanted to serve people. And of course, uh, Madame Mary Curie, who braved all odds from poverty to prejudice against women scientists, uh, a Nobel Prize winner two times. So uh, using these ideals, we began our life. Me and my sisters began our lives. Now, uh, right from the very beginning, when I was a child, I used to wonder, 
that what is the purpose of my existence? Uh, do we have no purpose? I used to wonder why are there so many human beings? Why isn't there just one? Or, or maybe, you know, the other could be another type, but there's so many human beings of the same type. So I used to struggle to find an indication of a sign that I'm unique. So I guess that is a question in everybody's mind, not just mine. We want to be unique. We want to do something which is different. And I was quite fascinated by a TV series called Star Trek. And there was a line in the introduction which said that uh, we, we will discover planets where no man has gone before. And that used to fascinate me. I wanted to do something which nobody had done before. And right from the very beginning, this was what I thought about public opinion. I had written all this in my diary back when I was 14 years old. And later on, I wrote this in, in my book too. I feel that public opinion is a combined babble of several copies of a human being. Chaos, something not worth heeding to. And I also felt that only a few of us could find our purpose. The rest would heed to the chaotic bubble and perish purposeless. In my quest to find my purpose, I made up my mind to shut my ears and numb my brain to the collective opinion of people. So that's something I've done from the very beginning. I never really take care of what people are saying to me. So this, their discouragement is not, does not affect me a little, little bit also. Then uh, next, I wanted to um, plan what I'm going to do next. And um, of course, discovery, as I have already said, I wanted to discover something new. And I wanted to discover a new planet, which is waiting for centuries. Um, but I was not much interested in space science. So I thought, why don't I do something in, um, you know, biological sciences where uh, various bacteria, fungi, viruses are there and they're all new and undiscovered as, you know, very recently, now two years back, our life has been transformed because of a novel coronavirus. So I thought, back then I thought that why don't I work on um, these microbes? It would give me the same feeling as discovering uh, something totally new and novel. So this again, I have uh, quoted from my book. I wanted to step where no man or woman has stepped before. I, and I wanted to stand at threshold of my discovery, awed and amazed, falling to my knees, to look up at the skies and open my arms. The reason of my being born would be revealed to me in the ensuing silence. I wanted that moment in my life. So I I decided, uh, even as a child, that these are going to be the three, three um, points. Solitude, that means I need to start living on my own, need to stop depending on people, and need to enjoy my solitude, need to enjoy being alone. Focus, of course, and focus can only come if there is solitude. And of course, as I said before, indifference to public opinion. After putting uh, that in, uh, uh, in a particular way, I made up my mind to pursue biological science. And the moment I made, made up my mind, I started feeling a shift in the universe through some mystical signaling my undiscovered planet that was lying dormant knew that I had started walking towards it. An alignment of forces started taking place. I was on my way. So uh, back in 1988, right after I finished school, I entered AIMS as a student. Now AIMS was, is a medical institution that is a dream for every student, I think. And uh, within AIMS, I chose Department of Biophysics. Now, um, if, you, uh, if you see our building, it's a single story flat structure and it is, it is flanked by dense Ashoka trees. So it's a very pleasant place to work in, a very peaceful place. And as I said before, I love solitude and peace. So I felt this is where I have reached and I want to continue literally all my life over here. Now my uh, supervisor, Professor T.P. Singh, he's somebody who's very well known. I met him and uh, I, have, I told him I want to work with you. And uh, he's a great um, idol amongst us. And he said, you will be serving humanity. Maybe the fruits of your work will not be born in your lifetime, yet your life would, will have made a difference to this world. Now, this sketch is from my book, Secret of Red Crystals. That was the first time he told me to look into the microscope and look at protein crystals. So basically we had started working on extra crystallography. That was the focus of his lab. And what he said to me was that you want easy, you please walk into some other lab. This is not going to be as tough as, as it gets. No holidays, no timeouts, no excuses, no shortcuts. Literally, it's going to be like a meditation with no rewards for years and years. So if you're ready for that, get started. Otherwise, find some other lab. 
Now, I always love challenges and this was something I could not resist. I was uh, fully uh, ready for this kind of a life and I decided to work on uh, protein structure based uh, drug design using extra, extra crystallography. Now, um, if you talk about crystallization of proteins, this is the biggest bottleneck um, which, which can be found in this kind of work. Because crystallizing a protein is a strange mystical combination of skills, understanding, intuition, and luck. Some people even call it dumb luck, but uh, I feel after working so long in this field that uh, it's, uh, you need to have a lot of experience. You need to put maybe 1,000 crystallization dishes, and you sometimes start getting intuitive about it. But many people have compared this to searching for a needle in the haystack. So this is in brief what we began on, rational structure-based drug design, in which the three-dimensional structure of a drug target is used to discover and design future drugs. And this three-dimensional structure can only be determined if you have a protein crystal. So that was a very big challenge in front of me. And this is just in briefly describing what uh, other steps and what. Uh, in disease state, we first look at a protein that is upregulated, then we isolate the protein, we purify it, crystallize it, of course, it's not so simple. As I said, crystallization is the toughest um, step over here. If we get lucky and get a protein crystal, then we go for extra diffraction, electron density map elucidation, and finally protein structure. There are a lo lot of steps, then active site map mapping, and then drug design. And this is an iterative cycle, which goes on till you actually achieve a drug. So I was assigned a protein called lactoferrin. Lactoferrin is a, a protein that is red in color because it's an iron binding protein and it protects babies by binding to bacterial iron. So it basically uh, takes away the necessary iron from the iron requiring bacteria and deprives them so that uh, the bacteria die. Though it's of course found in many other secretions, but uh, it's majorly found in milk. So I was given this really interesting project. So um, the force which has created life is also the force which protects life. The force creates a protector of the baby, a red colored protein called lactoferrin, which fights and kills bacteria. So lactoferrin basically protects the neonate, the newly born. And this is the structure of lactoferrin. So the structure of lactoferrin had already been elucidated. So I was told by my supervisor to do something totally new, which of course, as I said, I was interested in. I was given a problem uh, before I uh, go to the problem. I'll describe that uh, actually this, these are uh, the pictures of my own daughter. She's now uh, 22, but uh, back when she was just born. So lactoferrin is a complete uh, armor for the neonate. It also uh, takes care apart from defense, nutrition development. So this was the structure of lactoferrin, which had already been elucidated. Now I'll just describe it briefly so that we can understand the uh, slides which are coming up. We, uh, this entire structure is uh, divided into two lobes, N lobe, C lobe. Both the lobes are connected by an interconnecting helix over here in orange. And then each lobe is further divided into two domains, N1, N2, C1, C2 in case of C lobe. And there's an iron binding site in between both the domains. So there are basically two iron molecules inside, two uh, iron atoms inside the lactoferrin molecule. So if the structure had already been done, so what was I to do? This was what I had to do. Uh, so far, on. Uh, Nobody who had able to crystallize C lobe or N lobe. So I was told that if I could crystal, first of all, I could use a protease by which I could cut this particular interconnecting helix into two perfect lobes. Then I could purify both the lobes and crystallize one of them. The history said that it cannot be done. It is impossible because a lot of uh, scientists had worked on it and they had never been able to do it Every time they, were, they would cut, uh, they would use a protease and it would cut at some other side, not right in the middle. And even if uh, they found something which could, which could cut right in the middle, they were not able to purify or crystallize. So this was my uh, lonely planet, which was waiting for me. This was what I had to do. And of course, this picture I've just put up to, uh, to show that your footsteps can only be carved on a path on which no one has gone before. Because if it's already been carved, even if you walk on it, your footsteps won't be evident. But if there's a, a completely raw path like that in which you are the first person to walk, your footsteps will be remembered even after you're no more. So these were briefly the steps. Isolate, purify lactoferrin from bovine cholesterol. Cholesterol is the first milk. 
then hydrolyze it with protease, purify, crystallize structure and drug design. So uh, since I had to uh, get a lot of colostrum, it was not possible to do that in Delhi. I had to go to National Dairy Research Institute in Karnal, which was 145 kilometers away. And I had to isolate lactoferrin from buffalo and bovine colostrum. So this was back in 1991 when you did not have any mobile phones. And this was the way it was in NDRI. Uh, I had literally found my solitude, but you know it looks nice when I'm describing it this way, but it used to be a very, very lonely time because I had to literally live alone over there. And uh, I had to, now this was view from the, my lab, absolutely nobody. I used to be the only one working over there. And this was the cattle yard where I had to go and uh, the cholesterol can only come when there is a calving, when a baby is born. So that is very unpredictable. Sometimes it happens within a day. Sometimes it takes one month. And I had to literally just sit there and wait for it and um, cut off from everyone. Because back then we used to only communicate through letters. We could not talk to, um, like I couldn't talk to my parents also uh, using mobile. There was no mobiles and uh, the telephones were very difficult. So this was the way life was. Now this was a sketch from my book again. So there was a, uh, I had a cycle which, was, which I had named Dusty. And I used to ride it every morning at 4 a.m. I used to go to cattle yard and then every evening at 4 p.m. And mostly it won't happen. The carving would take a long, long time and I had to do nothing but wait for it. So this is how it was. Even if the carving would take place, the uh, first the calf has to, the newborn calf has to drink. Whatever he, he or she leaves, that only I used to get. And sometimes it used to be very less. So this is a typical struggle of a researcher who is starting in this kind of a field. However, I managed to isolate and uh, purify some lactoferrin. Now, this is a red colored protein that I got from milk. The next step was proteolysis of lactoferrin. That, is, that means I had to cut the lactoferrin into two lobes, which was very tough because the people who had worked before had not been able to do it. There's a lot of history uh, that I, I struggled a lot, but I've cut that short because I wanted to uh, keep the time over here. So anyway, after exploring a lot of proteases for many years, I was able to find a protease known as protein SK, which gives two proper lobes, C lobe and N lobe. C lobe and N lobe are both 40 kilodalton in size because lactoferrin is 80 kilodalton. So I managed to, 1992-93, I managed to isolate and purify both N and C lobe. It was like almost three years down the line, I had to finish my work and till now I, I had only been able to purify. Then came the bottleneck, crystallization of sea lobe of lactoferrin. First, I got no crystals, and then I got, as you can see, very small crystals. They were not diffractable, so it was of no use. 1993, I continued the quest, and I used to dream of these kind of crystals that I'm showing, but I never got these kind of crystals. So finally, in 1994, interestingly, I got some diamond-shaped crystals, and I got uh, very excited because they, they looked beautiful. But they were not red, and that worried me because uh, sea lobe is red in color. So ideally, the crystal should be red in color. So my biggest fear that time was that are they protein SK crystals? Because you know when I was purifying like the sea lobe from um, the hydrolysate, then protein SK which cuts lactoferrin would uh, it has similar molecular weight as sea lobe. So I was fearing that probably protein SK has come with sea lobe and it is crystallized because actually protein SK crystallizes very fast and it also gives diamond shaped crystals always. And it has already been crystallized a number of times. So my work that did not have any merit if they were protein SK crystals. So I was praying to God, they are not protein SK crystals. But when we put it on an X-ray beam, the fears came true. They were protein SK crystals. I had just managed to crystallize the protease, which had already been crystallized 100 times. So it was a complete failure at the first step. So 1994 to 1997, three more years I spent completely failing. At that time, I got uh, some hope from this, uh, uh, this particular quote, that failure is just a red flag, which indicates to you what should not be done. Go ahead and fail every day, which I was failing every day anyway. With every failure, you will narrow down to success. Success was not happening, but I was going on. 1997, I got crystals, which are not diamond shaped. So now you can see I started in 1991 and I spent six years of my life, of my youth, working on a problem which was not yielding any results. So I got uh, these crystals, they were not diamond shaped. So I felt they were not red. So, but uh, since 
proteinase K always gives diamond shaped crystals. I was hoping this would be C lobe only, uh, even though it's not red. But fears came true again. It was modified proteinase K. So from a failure, I became an epic failure. I was uh, completely at a loss what to do now because six years had passed. But in 1998, I managed to finish my thesis because I made this discovery, which was also a discovery, though not the one I wanted, that there's a lactoferrin fragment which binds and inactivates proteinase K. And this, uh, that is why the proteinase K crystals are not diamond shaped. We found a fragment of lactoferrin, which is generated upon proteolysis, which binds to lactoferrin, I mean, which binds to proteinase K and inactivates it. And that is how it protects babies. That's another method. Like one was iron binding. This is a second method. A lactoferrin peptide designed to protect lactoferrin against deadly proteases is present in seed. So this was a kind of discovery, but you know, I was extremely, extremely disappointed that I have not been able to crystallize zero. In the meantime, life went on and I got married. I, I had made up my mind to marry uh, my, uh, um, my classmate, Dr. Naval. He was also my batchmate in Ames. So um, because I was very clear that I have to work very hard and I have to continue my research, I was determined and I did not want to fall into any, any kind of traditional uh, kind of mindset that would pull me back. Now I'm coming to why I thought like that because percentage of women graduates versus percentage of women employed in India in STEM, that is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. If you see that percentage of women graduates in science is 43%, but by the time you're employed in R&D, you're just 14%. So where do the women actually go? What happens is that they get married and they, um, of course, motherhood also happens. And um, this problem is all over the world, all over the world, not just in India. Uh, of course, much more prevalent in countries like ours that uh, women, women are supposed to be the primary caregiver for the child. So I knew that I was coming to that stage in my life and I wanted to be fully prepared because I was not willing to let go of uh, my passion. That was my science, my work. In 1998, I got my uh, PhD degree, seven years of unfulfilled dreams, but completed it. And at that time I was in a state of mind as if I'm chasing a mirage. I also was losing enthusiasm for work because I'd burnt myself out, 91 to 98, seven years. 1998, I decided I'll change my project. I decided I will not work on lactoferrin. I had had enough of failure and I wanted to taste success. So I worked on many different projects like phospholipase A2, uh, cobra venom factor, and uh, car um, cardiotoxins and all. And surprisingly, I did pretty well. I was able to crystallize everything and I got lots of papers and awards, everything going. Then uh, motherhood. Uh, my daughter Alma was born in 1999 and Sita was born in 2000. At that time, uh, that was a time when I was feeding them uh, because I knew that lactoferrin is very important for them. And for the first time I saw lactoferrin, not just as a scientific project, but as a hero who appears in the darkest hour to perform its duty to protect babies. The moment I had Alma and Sita, lactoferrin started haunting my dreams again. I started thinking uh, that why did I leave lactoferrin? Agreed, it was very tough, but uh, this is not what I wanted. I did not want to give up. So 2001 and 2003, I started working on lactoferrin again. Mary Curie had never given, given up on radium, so why did I give up on zero? Despite all the successful publications, I was feeling empty. And of course, Dr. Teep is in my guide, my mentor. He, uh, this is what he always says. We do not choose scientific topics only to beef up our biodata. We, as medical researchers, have a moral responsibility to explore the unknown and to make it known to the rest of the mankind. So I resumed my work on lactoferrin. And this is a sketch from my book that uh, this is how I continued with both motherhood and science. I used to get my children to the department, uh, let them uh, play or sleep uh, in the lab while I used to work. And of course, this is uh, quite a uh, sensitive topic that we should have really good childcare uh, for women uh, professionals in STEMs, STEM because they need to work and um, it's very tough for them. So, but that's for some other talk. So on 30th June, 2003, Sunday, just um, now this again, I've written in my book. Maybe you could grab the book if you want, if you're interested more in the story. 
just as a, I was, I opened the refrigerator to take out some uh, protein. And just as I was about to shut it, my eyes fell on a small vial kept at the back, took it out, and I saw that I'd written sea lobe on it. I remembered that it was an old sample of sea lobe that I'd made years ago, forgotten. It was just lying there. So, you know, that's how sea lobe used to whisper to me all the time, all those long years from 1991 to 2003. One more time, just one more time, crystallize me one more time. Maybe this time I work. And I was again tempted to crystallize sea lobe. To my surprise, within a few hours, it's so ironical, within a few hours, I got red crystals. And I was still, after, uh, you know, hoping so many times and uh, failing, I felt, no, maybe something is wrong. Again, I'm going to get protein SK only. Maybe it's disguised itself as a red, red protein this time. And uh, that night, none of us went home. Everybody in the lab stayed uh, in the lab. And uh, we just uh, put it on the X-ray beam, those crystals, and we waited for the data to get elucidated. And that night, I remember I slept in the lab. In the morning when I woke up, the first three-dimensional structure of sea lobe of lactoferrin was in front of our eyes. So that means 11 years I had, after I had started this work, I saw what I was hoping for this uh, three-dimensional structure of CELO, which had never, never been done before. So now this again from my book, I covered my eyes with my hands and cried tears of disbelief and happiness, years of longing, dreaming, wishing, and then years of despair and anguish a bottle inside me. But the floodgates had opened finally. I fell down in front of the computer graphic screen on my knees and looked at the CELO structure, which seemed to get blurred through my tears. Now, this was a moment that I had dreamt about, that I will stand in front of my um, planet, the planet which was waiting for me to discover it. And this is exactly how I would feel. And of course, we published in various journals and it also came uh, in uh, on the cover page of various journals like Biophysical Journal, Acta, Crystallographica D. And uh, a lot of uh, national awards followed because uh, the work uh, was such. Uh, I got a uh, President's Award from uh, uh, Pratibha Patil, the, president, the awardee. Strangely, I got it on 8th March only, and today is 8th March. Then I um, from uh, I got this DBT National uh, Bioscientist Award for Career Development. Then I got Kalpana Chavla Excellence Award. This I got from Kalpana Chavla's father only, the gentleman standing next to me, Kalpana Chavla's father. And uh, this quote, Khudi ko kar buland itna ki har takdeer se pehle khuda bandi se khud puche ki bata teri raza kya hai. Now, uh, this my father used to often... Uh, say um, this means that do not depend on others uh, whatever you are just depend on yourself and make yourself so great that before every uh, writing every destiny god should ask himself tell uh, what do you want so uh, this has been uh, exactly my philosophy in life so this is the story that i have put in uh, this book secret of red crystals which is available easily on Amazon and Flipkart. So this I'd already written in 2017. So I wish, you know, I could say, and then I lived happily ever after. But uh, happily ever after doesn't happen. So I'll uh, move on to July 2017. As you can see that uh, Alma and Sitab both are grown-ups. Uh, now Alma is studying med medicine, MBBS, and Sitab is studying architecture in um, BIAC. And uh, it seemed that life had worked out pretty well, but something happened in July 2017. It was a warm July Friday evening when I noticed that I was feeling a bit warmer. I had fever. Since it was just a bit of fever, I popped in a crocine and I thought it's okay. We'll just manage it because this is how I used to be. I, used, I never ever got seriously ill. But um, I progressively kept on getting worse every day. So I started getting tingling in my um, in my extremities, that is my uh, fingers and toes, and I started losing strength. And I literally could not walk after just a week. I lost uh, something like 10 kg suddenly, and I was like, what has happened to me? So I was told I'm having a very, very rare disease, which is known as Quillain-Barre syndrome, GBS. From now on, I'm going to call it GBS. So it is a rapid onset muscle weakness caused by immune system damaging peripheral nervous system. The cause is unknown, but it is uh, it is no you know it is quite a rare disease. It's it happens only for one case per one lakh people, 
and it can be triggered by infection or surgery or vac vaccination. So I think um, I had some fever and after that fever, I got this, so it could be due to infection. And death occurs in about 7.5% of those affected and the rest are literally paralyzed. Some of them are never able to get up from the wheelchairs or beds ever again. So this is the disease I had. And I was uh, literally bound uh, on the wheelchair. I was unable to. And then there was there even came a point that even wheelchair I could not use. I was literally bedridden. August 18, 2017, I got admitted in Ames, not um, as a professor, but as a patient, because the illness seemed to be traveling upwards because that's how GPS is. It's, it begins from your toes and it travels upwards, finally taking over the spinal cord and your brain. I knew that with the sudden finality that my body was slowly on its way to getting paralyzed. So this was a stage I realized I was. So what followed were endless days of misery. I was told that uh, I may not be able to now get all right ever again. So uh, this, uh, I wrote another book after this that was known as, known as Dragonfly's Purpose. And I, this is from that uh, book. I would wait for night to come so that I could sleep. You know, when a person is bedridden or paralyzed, he can't just wait to sleep because uh, then that person can dream. And in his dreams, he can become anything. I never dreamt of winning awards, taking vac vacations or landing any windfalls. Instead, my dreams are ordinary, in which I lived a normal life, going to work or to the mall or to meet my parents. You know, that um, um, these things we take for granted. We feel that uh, we'll just get up now, go and um, go to the mall, buy something, meet our friends. But when you're paralyzed, you can do none of that. So you just dream of it. The moment I would wake up, I would think everything is normal and then the realization would come crashing down on me. I was in bed, struck with GPS, I could not go anywhere. I could not plan my day, which is a normal thing for us. We wake up and we plan our day. But a person who's lying in bed can do nothing except wait for the day to just get over, look at the walls and do nothing. And at that time, I made up my mind that I am the same person who uh, discovered the, stru the structure of CELO, which had never been done before. So why should I believe people who are telling me that I'm not going to ever be able to walk again? Why should I not work on ma myself? I read a lot about this, this disease and I realized that the only way to do is, is sheer willpower and through a lot of working on your, yourself, that is physiotherapy, occupational therapy. So this, uh, this picture is of, my, of those days when I made up my mind that I'm going to ditch the wheelchair and I'm going to somehow, with a superhuman effort, try to walk. This is my physiotherapist. I decided I'm never going to cry again, never will I feel sorry for myself again. I will fight and fight till I beat GBS hollow. GBS may have happened to many people and one yet this time it has happened to someone who will fight it out. So GBS had not probably realized that it had affected a person who was going to beat it. So this was September 2017. I started getting better. I, you know, there was a time when I was, I was thinking I was just not get better, but suddenly after some days I realized I am getting better. Like uh, I, in this, I needed some assistance to walk. Then after a month or so, I realized that even though I'm stumbling, but I'm able to walk. I will never look back again. Nothing will stop me now from loving myself and transforming myself into someone beautiful who would always shine in the darkness of adversity that fate had thrown to me. Um, back then, I started reading about dragonflies. I, they're very, very interesting creatures. You know why they're interesting is because uh, a dragonfly lives for one year inside the water. And that one year, it's just a gray, a colorless pu uh, pupa. And... It just gets two months to become a mature dragonfly with very gleaming, colorful wings. And in those two months, it dances and it flies. It has a great time. And uh, dragonflies are so interesting that there are a lot of movies on them, a lot of legions on them. They're worshipped everywhere. So what is a dragonfly's purpose? It is to search for the extraordinary moments in the ordinary spaces of life. Its purpose is to snap back to life after being kicked down by the first misfortune. I got very inspired by dragonflies that even, uh, you know, even if uh, their wings are pulled, they're pulled, they somehow manage to get them back. And uh, the wings are so strong that they can resist anything. So that really inspired me. By February, 2018, working very hard on myself, I used to wake up in the morning, do my physical um, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, practice myself, walk, 
has to count the steps. So earlier, I was only able to walk 100 steps, then I increased to 200, went on and on, did everything I could. And I would put my contact lenses myself, even though I would drop them many times, kept on doing this, doing this all alone, again, solitude, and uh, managed to at least stand straight and walk a bit. Back then, uh, January 2019, so almost one more year had passed, Ames Got Talent got organized in which uh, uh, various uh, departments had to get together and uh, dance together. And uh, one of them would be a winner. And uh, what, I have not, uh, what I have not expressed uh, before this slide that I love dancing. For me, dancing is uh, a, a great state to be in. And I used to love to dance before GBS uh, came to my life. And I should really miss dance. So I made up my mind, I'm going to participate in Ames Got Talent. So this is my departmental team, which I had choreographed. I choreographed this entire dance. And uh, it was based on uh, uh, regional, uh, uh, not regional, um, communal um, and uh, religious disharmony and harmony. We participated and we won the first prize. This is Dr. Indeep Pilera, our director, who's uh, giving us uh, the prize, Department of Biophysics. Games got talent. And of course, more pictures of this. You can see the happiness on my face because it was a great, great feeling from being paralyzed to winning a prize in a dance competition. So this is my book, A Dragonfly's Purpose, also available on Amazon and Flipkart, in which this entire journey from the moment when I discovered that I'm having GPS to this point where uh, we managed to get the prize, and everything in the middle, that is how I made up my mind that I'm going to work on myself. I'm going to get out of this wheelchair. I'm going to walk. I'm going to dance. I'm going to do everything that can be done. I'm not going to sit back. And how my uh, family, my friends, my doctors, all of them, they pitched in, how they helped me out. You know, you cannot do anything alone. You, you need a support system. My children, my husband, my friends, they all got together and they would uh, assign duties to each other that, okay, today you have to make her walk and tomorrow I will make her walk. So I thank all of them that uh, they, because of them, I was able to achieve uh, walking again. So that was uh, about GBS. Uh, then we thought again, happily ever after, but then again, there's no happily ever after in January, 2020, as you all know, COVID-19 came. And again, life halted, not just for me, for, but for everybody in the world. Uh, SARS-CoV-2, of course, uh, 5.5 million deaths by now. So at that time, uh, being in AIMS, uh, being a professor in AIMS, I had to come literally every day to work. We were not given any leaves. We had to be here. We had to work. And uh, I used to see, look around me, and I used to see the warriors in white. Uh, all of us wearing white coats, working hard. Even when people were huddling inside their homes, we had to come here. We had to face our own uh, fears and be here. And that got me really interested in this. And I wrote another book called Warriors in White. That is because they have to show up due to, uh, for duty despite the lockdown. I found them very inspiring. And I feel very privileged that I was one of them. Uh, and what I did in this book was that I likened uh, these warriors to the planets of Navgrah. Navgrah means uh, basically the nine heavenly planets which are found in Hindu astrology. Uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, Moon, Rahu, Mercury, Venus, and Ketu, and Sun. That is how it's, in, it's not Western astrology where you have Pluto and uh, Uranus, uh, Neptune. You have, this is, uh, Sun and Moon are also counted in Navgre. So the idea was, this was that I likened every, um, every Jupiter, uh, for example, Jupiter was compared with Dr. Damandeep Singh. Uh, this was a chapter that I, um, focused on overcoming the challenges of wearing PPE. Dr. Davindeep Singh is, uh, is having problems in hearing and he puts hearing aids. And despite putting hearing aids, he used to wear PPE and sometimes the PPE used to, um, you know, the, his hearing aids used to stop working because there would be so much sweating inside the PPE, but he would still keep working. So Jupiter is a planet of positivity, optimism. So I had compared him to the planet Jupiter and I told his story right from his childhood and uh, how he overcame uh, this hearing problem and became a doctor. And um, then, of course, Dr. Archana Shashi, I compared her with Saturn, which is the planet for discipline. How she overcame the fear of getting infected, because just when COVID came, there was a lot of fear amongst doctors. 
and her, every all these doctor stories i began from the childhood and what inspired them to become doctors and suddenly they are finding themselves in the midst of a pandemic and how they are deriving inner strength to carry on dr vasudev datta sharma venus fostering commitment to duty dr meet minare mars uh, he was the one who got infected with covid not once but twice of course by now everybody has got infected many of us have but back then getting infected by with corona virus was a very big deal and he got it infected twice and uh, came back uh, dr saurabh bhatia mercury because mercury is the planet for mental health and uh, his chapter deals with how he overcame depression and, and anxiety as a doctor uh, during the pandemic because you know the mental health of doctors was much at stake and it's a very very inspiring chapter of how you can overcome uh, these kind of anxiety problems not just for doctors but everybody dr mohita sharma moon because uh, moon is for inner strength again which she refused to shut down her own hospital her own center a lot of people shut it down because there was a lot of fear of infection or because they were uh, they didn't want to put in the money to carry on but uh, she they refused to shut her hospital down and her story also from beginning till end and finally uh, dr randeep bulleria our director as son leading from the front he was uh, the person i think so january 16th when um, there was a lot of fear of vaccination after fear of covid there was a fear of fear of vaccination and he got uh, the vaccine just to show that everything is all right his story right from the beginning when i started a story from the point that apes was created to this point when uh, you know when, when covid came and how apes fought back at that time and how he led not just um, not just apes but the entire country so these were some of the press reports about uh, what is and white and uh, after uh, warriors in white now something very recent october 2021 at that time i i started thinking that what about our children because you know we talk a lot about covid warriors warriors in white and uh, police uh, and security people who are working hard but we have forgotten our children who are actually the biggest heroes because they are so small they don't even understand what is covid and they are being they literally their childhood was lost for two years the forced to stay inside their uh, their homes and uh, they had to uh, su suddenly learn how to do online classes of course those were the privileged children then there were some children who had to drop out of schools because their parents lost uh, not only their um, jobs but also their lives so lots of our children were orphaned i decided to write a book for children and especially a child called bholu uh, who is uh, inside his house locked up in the pandemic and he meets covid covid is a baby corona virus so i put all the scientific facts and in a very fictionalized way so that the children can understand and enjoy of course this book all adults can also read because many people have told me that adults have enjoyed reading it too it's not only for children so while i was doing all this i got very interested in science promotion in society because you know like i said in the beginning of my um, talk that i thought that maybe after 20 30 years i will be like working hard making a name uh, as uh, a great scientist and uh, but i think somewhere my path changed i decided that i can continue my scientific work but i also want to put energies into science promotion in society because in covid times we realized that our society every society not just india everywhere uh people do not understand scientific terms like they do not know exactly what is virus what is vaccine they are lost they don't have anybody to actually uh, explain them in simple terms what all these things mean so that is why there is so much of fear of the virus there was so much of vaccine hesitancy because nobody was telling them uh, nobody was making them understand so i thought that it is our duty as doctors as scientists that we need to go and talk to people in their own language so uh, book writing was one way but i had to do something more so of course this is uh, about uh, kovi's promise and tumara bolu it was launched uh, by dr gulera and we uh, there was a lot of buzz even now it's a lot of people are uh, reading this book and this is a sketch of uh, in this book in which the book ends very beautifully it's a friendship between a child and a baby corona virus in the end the baby corona virus leaves the child gets vaccinated and life goes on as usual 
So it ends at a very positive note. So as I was saying that I wanted to do something more than just writing books, because I wanted to promote uh, science in the society. So uh, I founded BioFootprints. Now this is a not-for-profit uh, society. Aims and objectives are science popularization society, bridging gap between basic and translational science, connecting students with mentors and philanthropic activities. And um, you know, with me, I have other colleagues like Dr. Pradeep Sharma, uh, Dr. Sonika Bhatnagar, Dr. Naval Vikram, and uh, Dr. Akshita Gupta. We are all contributing. And this is the website. You can check out the website of BioFootprints, become a member. And the idea is that we talk to common people about science. Uh, till now, we were doing it only online, but uh, now that physical uh, activities have started, we've decided to make trips to uh, various villages, to schools, to educate people in simple terms about science. And apart from that, uh, I also decided to, to make my YouTube channel. So I was really interested in this and uh, my children told me because they belong to the new generation that there is something, there's a career which is known as you, YouTuber. So that got me very interested and they said that it's something which contributes a lot. So I thought, why don't uh, scientists have their own YouTube channel? They don't have to go through any organization. As long as you are doing something good and worthy, you can do it yourself. So I started a channel known as Science Popularization by Professor Sujata Sharma. And I started uh, literally using a, um, a phone camera and uh, a stand and a small hand mic. I started uh, talking about uh, various things like uh, what are corona, uh, COVID vaccines, what are coronavirus variants, and uh, of course, um, in conversation with other scientists and doctors. So this is just my, uh, you know, humble, um, it is my humble approach, my uh, hope that I'm making some contribution to the society also apart from just discovering my, uh, my planets which are waiting for me. Finally, I'll end my uh, talk with this, that uh, I, like I said, I am very inspired by dragonflies. The dragonfly has to fly, it has to dance, it has to transcend realms of possibilities. It is oblivious of anyone's opinion as it single-mindedly pursues its own purpose. So thank you very much uh, for your patience. I'll end this talk here. Thank you so much, Dr. Sujata Sharma. I have to say that it was a treat to listen to you. I am, I am in lack of words right now. I am in a, I'm in an absolute emotional state. I have a napkin besides me, which <laughs> used quite sometimes while your talk was going on. Uh, I have forgotten almost what I am supposed to formally say when a talk gets over. But I can only say that, uh, first of all, a standing ovation to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Brilliant. I, I believe that when the world will have uh, women like you around, uh, there is absolutely no fear. There is, uh, there, there, uh, there is no fear of um, sad. Uh, uh, there is no fear of becoming sad. There is no fear of uh, uh, not overcoming any difficulty. There is no fear of death. Uh, there is no fear of any negativity. You ooze out positivity right from chasing an impossible dream. What nobody has done but see, merely out of your passion, you wanted to just crystallize that sea lope thing. You were on and on and on it. You were, uh, you said that you just got a degree, but you were very unhappy, you know, because the problem remained unsolved. That indicated the passion that you have. And trust me, I'm, I'm too small to say these words, but it is the passion which leads any person or any venture uh, uh, meet its success. Right from being passionate about what you want to do, you have, uh, you have um, uh, also shown how to be perseverant. You were on it and especially the quotes that you used, suddenly the seal of coming and telling you one more, just one more try, try to crystallize it, try to, try to crystallize me. I mean, beautiful. How beautifully you are able to understand your inner self and you're able to connect with the physical things around you. I don't know if I'm telling it correctly, but I believe um, everything has a connection. 
whatever yeah. is around you physically has some kind of connect spiritually something within you absolutely that that drives you in hunt of it in search of it and absolutely. 99.999% people give up on their inner voice they're like you know i think i am not listening it correct this is not the practical reality in front of me what i am uh, thinking is a mere hallucination is a mere wizard talk it's not something uh, possible to achieve let me go with what is happening practically but you are amongst the, those rather you are the first one whom i know is um, sticking to what your inner self is telling you going behind it and finally getting it i feel so proud i feel so happy i feel so exhilarated to have uh, to have you over here in fact uh, my technical team uh, just informed me that anupama you are uh, you were on mute and the entire introduction of dr sujatha sharma uh, you were only on the screen and your voice was not heard to all my listeners to all the future listeners of this video i must say that what i introduced her was just the tip of the iceberg those are just the formal accolades that this beautiful lady sitting in front of me is having she is much more than what i just said at the beginning of my talk she is way beyond that i i have to thank you from the bottom of my heart in fact i have to thank dr milin for giving this opportunity to having me know you and uh, uh, ma'am with your presence as i summed up in the beginning there is absolutely no fear i believe this talk was on a women's day specifically you know maybe meant for women but uh, it is for every individual every living being on this earth to find out how you can be passionate perseverant and positive and get what you want in your life nothing can stop you if you have decided something for yourself you have to decide something for yourself rest bhagwan hai na wo dekh lenge it's like that i mean beautiful awesome i i wish this talk uh, just keep uh, just uh, just keeps going and i just keep listening to you i wish you were in pune i wish i could meet you in person and sit hours talking to you and learning more about you uh, such a privilege for we know it by solutions to have you over here in fact you mentioned about the bio footprints uh, we know it by solution is working in this area of infection prevention so i must say that in the in the in the initial days like in the year of 2016 2017 when we were talking about preventing infections people did not pay any heed to us you know because people were talking about really uh, really major diseases infection was not on anybody's mind people were not bothered about infections now even a child understand what an infection is what even a highly educated person understand what an infection is what is the importance of preventing this infection we at vinod by solutions will be very very happy to collaborate with bio footprints and uh, uh, and you know work towards educating masses around us for uh, various science based activities including you know how important it is to keep few things away like infections so uh, i will take a formal uh, goodbye note now but ma'am stay tuned we'll uh, we'll be talking more so um, to all my dear friends um, who missed out on me introducing uh, this beautiful lady in front of me i will read our introduction only to make you people realize that how beyond she is beyond uh, 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 as per this introduction so ma'am with your kind permission can i once again introduce you yes of course thank you so yes, much sir. thank you ma'am so we just heard to the phenomenal talk that dr sujatha sharma gave and unlike what normally happens let me once again introduce this lady after her talk is over so as i said in the beginning that she is a lady who is just beyond who is beyond just an inspiration and i must say that it is my privilege to introduce a self made lady of such a magnanimous stature so dr sujatha sharma professionally and as i said tip of the iceberg is what i'm going to read is a protein structural biologist biophysicist writer and a professor at the department of biophysics of the all india institute of medical sciences new delhi she is known for her studies in the field of protein structure drug design and antimicrobial drug resistance she has been awarded the international tvos tvos prize for science popularization and the peak life women inspire award 
She has also been awarded the prestigious National Bioscience Award for Career Development and National Women Bioscientist Award by the Government of India. She is a recipient of Kalpana Chawla Excellence Award for her contributions in science and literature. She is the author of five science fiction books, which we just knew about. Kovi's Promise, Tumhara Bolu, Warriors in White, The Secret of the Red Crystals, and A Dragonfly's Purpose. Deeply passionate about fostering a scientific temperament in the society, she has her own YouTube channel that we know now called Science Popularization by Professor Sujata Sharma. She is the founding president of BioFootprints. I must say an amazing venture, amazing idea. It's a society which is consisting of scientists and doctors who are committed to pro promote science in the society. So with this note, as I just said, that this was just a formal tip of the iceberg kind of introduction to this lady. But we must all take inspirations from her. We must all take some amount of positivity from her. We must all learn how we have to stand up for ourselves, come out of the self-pity mode, be passionate about something and chase it. If you chase, you can achieve anything you want to because there are forces in the nature which are going to... Um, uh, resonate to your inner feelings and to your inner passion. So on that note, once again, thank you all for joining us on this beautiful event of Women's Day celebration by Wiener by Solutions. Hopefully many more such to come.